Hey folks, how you doing? This is Ignacio with North Star Senior Advisors and welcome to our monthly series. This is actually our third interview that we've done and uh, we call the series Self Care Matters, a mental health series. And today's topic is gonna be around anxiety. You know, there's a lot of factors going on, internal, external, so I, we thought it'd be a good thing to talk about anxiety, especially now. Um, really quick uh, about us, North Star Senior Advisors, we're a senior placement company, been here in Central Florida for about six years now. We help seniors and families transition into assisted living memory care options. Uh, feel free to check out our website for videos like these and our YouTube channel. And today, I have the pleasure of uh, having again with me, April Boykin. April is the owner of Counseling Resource Services. Uh, April, you want to tell us about yourself and your company? Hi, thank you for having me back. So Counseling Resource Services is an in-home or these days telehealth program that is designed to, to deal with Medicare and aged and disabled population, dealing with anything from anxiety and depression to chronic mental illness. And we are able to provide that through Medicare reimbursement. Um, for most people, there's no out-of-pocket cost. So. Excellent. Awesome. So let's get started today. Uh, so when we talk about anxiety, do you, you mind guiding us through maybe like a really quick definition? How do you, how do you actually define anxiety? You know, so anxiety actually is one of my favorite topics to talk about because anxiety is something that most people have most of their life. Children, infants can experience anxiety and it doesn't go away just because you retire or things change in your life. Anxiety really stays with us if you don't learn to manage. And the reason why is anxiety is your body's alarm system to tell you that something is wrong and you need to pay attention. But most of us experience it as the feeling of stress or worry and we don't pay attention to it. We say, oh, I'm so stressed and we shut it off and we keep doing what we're doing instead of recognizing that that is actually a warning sign our body, it's our engine like our check engine light that's telling us to slow down and to change our behavior. And so anxiety really should tell us that we are on overload and need to make some kind, some kind of change. Okay, excellent. So what, what type of effects would you say you would have on the body, you know, uh, in the mind, if you have continuous anxiety, because I think we're all, we can all get a little anxiety off, you know, here and there and, and kind of deal with it and get past it. But, you know, what if it's continuous? What, you know, what kind of effects are we talking about if you are constantly having anxiety in the body and mind? You know, that's, that's a great question because there is, there's an acute anxiety that happens you're in a car accident or you leave something at home that you need for a presentation or there's some, something that's an immediate acute anxiety that can usually be problem solved. And then you have chronic anxiety, where you have layers and layers and layers of anxiety about work or your health or your place to live or finances. And most people in our society have chronic levels of anxiety. And so, you know, you, it affects you and everyone else, physically, mentally, emotionally, and psychologically. So it can make any health condition worse. It can create high blood pressure. You think about when you get a new diagnosis, the first thing the doctor says to you is reduce your stress, right? And so it can make anything worse. It can, it can cause you not to sleep. It can cause you to eat too much or not enough. It can create, it can wreak havoc on your physical well-being. For mental it can make you forget things. It can give you confusion. I have so many people say to me, I, I think I have the onset of Alzheimer's because I can't remember things or I, I lose things. And I'll say, really, it's just your stress. Your anxiety level is so high that your brain can't focus on anything except dealing with that, right? Because we have to remember, anxiety is our body going into fight or flight. 
-hmm. It can make you irritable. It can make you sad. It can make you hypervigilant where you're always jumpy. It can make you cry easily at something that usually wouldn't make you upset. It, 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 can, it is pervasive and can affect every part of your body, every part of your life. Yeah, and for me, I would say personally, I noticed when, when I have anxiety, uh, the confusion. I, I usually have a hard time focusing if, if you know, subconsciously I'm anxious about something and I, I'm working with something else. Multitasking becomes uh, interesting, right? It's, if you have anxiety, you're not able to do it quite as good. Whereas when I find myself relaxed, focused, I can multitask a lot better. So I would definitely agree with that. Um, how do you recognize it and, and how do you become aware of it? Because I know sometimes in the daily routine, the hustle going on, you may not even realize you're right, you know, feeling anxiety, right? And, but you're having the symptoms. So how do you, what would you suggest for us to kind of step back and, and recognize that? You know, that it, a lot of people won't label it as anxiety. They'll say, I have too much stress or I'm just worried. And really all of that is part of anxiety. And so a lot of times people have other names for it, um, but particularly between men and women, men and women label it something different. But really what you're looking for is going to another room and forgetting what you're there for, you know, being on the phone and say, I'm looking for my phone. As soon as I find it, I'll be out the door. It's, it's mistakes or challenges, um, irritability for no reason, finding that you have low tolerance for things, finding that you have that onset of insomnia. But really it's that, it's that pervasive discomfort that you can't settle into anything, that you can't calm down for something. You can't sit down and relax. And so it's that absence of ever feeling truly relaxed or rested. And those are all really good indications that your anxiety or your stress or your overwhelm are, not, are on high. Yeah. One thing for me I notice is uh, once I recognize it, right, it's, uh, if it's something within my control, and I've learned this over time, how do I deal with it? I, I have to, you know, recognize it, but more importantly, how do I deal with that anxiety? What's the source of the anxiety? I find that it has to be addressed if it's within my control, right? I mean, there's various reasons why we may get anxiety, obviously, or stress. Uh, some, again, within our control, not, you know, out of our control, but I've noticed for me, it, it's very important to, to recognize the source of the anxiety and deal with it meaning either do something about it or recognize that there's nothing I can do about it, right? And, 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 and kind of cope with it, deal with it. And that personally helps me alleviate my anxiety. That's just, you know, I'm not the professional, but that's, that's me and what I have found to be useful. No, absolutely. That, that is, so we have to remember that anxiety is really your body kicking into fight or flight. So anxiety is your body saying there's some kind of stressor and your body doesn't know if it is a bear chasing you or an alligator, we're in Florida, an alligator chasing you in the woods, or if it is Medicare, you know, being on the phone to get billing done and it's just frustrating or setting up a doctor's appointment. They all feel the same to the body. And so the body gets a message that this is an irritant, this is a stressor, and your body kicks into fight or flight, which gives your body the energy to fight, to flee, to freeze, to hide, whatever it needs to do to survive. The problem is, is that's not necessary for most situations that we have every day. So you're absolutely right, recognizing that this isn't a threat. And that has to, that has to happen up here Mm -hmm. so that your body can relax because otherwise your body is being flooded with adrenaline and cortisol and it just keeps this chain going, this cycle going where your brain feeds your body and your body says, I'm on alarm and feeds your brain. So we want to break that cycle. And so some of the ways that you can break that cycle is breathing, is simply learning how to take controlled and managed breath. And so I want I want to show everybody a couple of those that you can do. The first one, which is my absolute favorite, and the one I use the most, is called a Durga breath. 
or a full belly breath. It's something if you take yoga or, or other forms of meditation, things like that, you've probably learned. Mm -hmm. But it's just really good hygiene at slowing our emotional reaction to anything. Because most of the time, when we get out of our emotion brain and into our wise mind, we're able to say, oh, that's not something I need to be overly upset about. Mm -hmm. So we're going to, if you'll join me, I'll show you how to do these breaths. Sure. First one is called a Durga breath, and it's my absolute favorite. And what I want you to do is put a hand um, on your chest, breastbone, heart center, whatever you want to say, and then right, one right below your ribs. And it's best to close your eyes and then to take a gentle breath in through your nose. And I say gentle, not deep, because not everybody can stand that. But just take a gentle breath in. and then release. And just doing that a couple of times begins to slow your pulse, it begins to slow your heart rate, it begins to calm your nervous system. And while you're doing this gentle breath, if you move your hand up to right under your collarbone and down right to your pubic bone, you can extend the breath a little bit more. Oh, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And you're recycling all mm -hmm. of that air that's in your lungs. Because most of the time when we are anxious or stressed, we are having short, shallow breaths. We're not getting enough good oxygen to our brains, throughout our bodies. But that Durga breath, and if you are having a cold or you feel congestion in your chest, you can even put a pillow behind your back and lay down and do it. It is great for getting your chest open and getting your breathing. Always do it with, with a level of comfort. You never want to push it. You never want to feel uncomfortable. But that will slow your autonomic nervous system down so that you can clear your brain so you can think better. Quick question. Because uh, typically, I, you know, the breathing I've done before, now placing the hands on the body, that's interesting. That's, that's different to me. Do you mind sharing the benefits of kind of like the physical aspect along with the breathing? Is there, is there some, something additional to traditional deep breathing? So what I find is that people who are not used to deep breathing mm -hmm. don't actually know what it feels like. Ah, yes. So when you become, when I do this, I frequently will have my hands in another position because I'm used to practicing. Okay. But to go from here you know, under the breast and above the breast to, you know, here, people don't recognize it unless they have their hands and they can feel that change. Mm -hmm. And that's the benefit of it. And eventually you probably won't need it. Got it. Okay. There's a second breath called your equal breath. And this is really good, particularly if you have insomnia or you're just even driving. You can even do this when driving. If you do it driving, don't close your eyes. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, stay safe. But um, it's, it's breathing in an account. And really what it does is you sh it shifts the focus of your brain and gets your body to match it. And so what you're going to do is inhale to the count of four and then exhale from the count of four. So um, you can close your eyes. Like I said, if you're using this in some place that you can't be closing your eyes, don't. But what you'll do is just focus on your breath and it coming across your lip and to the count of four. One, two, three, four, four, three, two, one, two, three, four, four, three, two, one. And if you are somebody who can do a longer breath, you can do six or you can do five, that's great. You don't, again, want to force it, mm -hmm. but just that shift can give your brain time to begin thinking of something else. It can get you out of that fight or flight. You can also use this with a hold at the top. So you'll do one, two, three, four and hold. And then four, three, two, one. And so you want to make that that exhale a little bit longer if you can. That'll slow your heart rate. So there are lots of ways that you can play with breathing. But really, what you want to do is use it when you don't need it. So that when you do, it's easy to slip into using it. 
So I can do this in between clients. I can do this while I'm on a phone call that's giving me a headache. I can do this, you know, in the morning when I wake up just to clear myself from a day. So it's something that you can do all of the time. Breathing is one of the most effective ways to reset your nervous system. Excellent. Good. Second thing I'm going to show you, which are some of my favorite, and I'm going to take my glasses off for that, but um, there is a whole field of study that's about acupressure. And so whether you learn about tapping or you learn about acupuncture, it is the way that we can access points on our body, just like a doctor of oriental medicine will with acupuncture and help our body speak to our body directly to tell us to calm down. So um, I'll give you a couple resources if you want to go and look them up, but there is something called a neurovascular hold. And so you put, um, if you have something that's upsetting, if you feel like you're in shock, um, you can put your hand on the top of your forehead and then one across the occiput in the back. And you take a gentle breath in and out through your nose. And if you're thinking about something sad, you just allow it to come through as a movie. If you've seen an accident, if you're in shock, if you're feeling overwhelmed or tearful, you can just hold this place and eventually you'll feel your hands pulsing between the two. But this is a wonderful way to calm your nervous system and reset what your brain is thinking. You can use the breathing that we just did. It's a great way to pair it. Yeah. And it's a lovely way to calm your nervous system. Yeah. It's interesting. It's like uh, you're feeling comforted at the same time as you're breathing uh the touch even though it's your own touch you feel like somebody's comforting you that's, that's interesting that's good well and you can do that for your children or partner or people that you're close to in life who are struggling with the headache or who are tearful you can hold their head in that way this way or hold it themselves and it's a really nurturing tool to use with people oh excellent Something else that you can do with acupressure is you can put your hand um, right under your arm at your bra leather level, and if you're not wearing a bra, across from your nipple or where they used to be, and you will cross over and touch your elbow. Um, and so there's a little hollow point in your elbow, okay, and then rock. And this, this directly affects your triple warmer or your fight or flight instinct and it calms your nervous system. It's called a um, triple warmer hug and it calms the nervous system and helps everything slow down. Um, I do this a lot in the car when I when traffic is really bad. You can also pat on those points and you can switch and do it on the other side. Um, and these two holds along with a lot of other ones can be found at innersource.net. That's a great resource for acupressure and a lot of other um, techniques. And there's one more that I'll show you, which is my absolute favorite. And it is called the Peacemaker. And it is to plug into your, um, to your vagus nerve, which is part of your parasympathetic nervous system, which calms your nervous system. And there's a little hole right behind your ear. It shouldn't be an open hole, it should be a closed hole. But if you can put your hand and put your middle finger right in front of your ear and cradle your face. And take a gentle breath in through your nose. And sigh it out. <sighs> this that works. <laughs> you know, your eyes are, are yeah. watering. You're yawning. It's called the Peacemaker, and you can get more information on, on that one from wellwithin.net. Either, but it is such a wonderful one. I'll use this in bed when I when I wake up and I have racing thoughts and I can't go back to sleep. I'll yeah. go on my side and go right back to sleep using yeah. this. Um, this one refocuses brain brain energy and body energy so well and just calms the nervous system. Yeah, I was gonna say I could probably use it definitely before going to bed too. You know, like yes, definitely yes. relaxing. I like that. It it clears the mind just like that. Um, and then kind of the last thing I want to talk about is mindfulness um, and thought stopping or changing. So we, have all, we all have heard about mindfulness and probably participated in some of those activities. And that can be anywhere from prayer and chanting and meditation and 
all the way to Tai Chi. There's so many different ways to get engaged with activities about mindfulness. But really the bottom line of what I want you to hear about from mindfulness is your ability to notice something is happening without making a personal judgment, without personalizing or taking on. So for example, if you watch the news, Instead of feeling the anxiety of all of the chaos that you may be seeing on the news, it's to take a step back and recognize that I can see this happening without having to escalate my emotional well-being. I can respond without being anxious. I can know that things are going on and that I need to pay attention without feeling bad. Because feeling bad doesn't make you do better. When you feel better, you have more energy and focus to get things done. And so it's allowing your body to short circuit the, the fear, which activates a lot of people. And so for mindfulness, it is a way of being or becoming. So one of the quickest ways we can hack our brain is to hum. Humming is one of the most effective ways that we, because you can't hold a negative thought and hum at the same time. And so it, you really can't sing, hum, but something. It's not just listening to music because a lot of times people are lost in music and they're not thinking about the music. They're thinking about all the other things. But if you actually engage, you change your vibration. If you're actually playing an instrument, you are changing your vibration. But most of us can hum. Some of us do not sound good when we sing and should never sing. But <laughs> yeah. everyone should sing no matter what you sound like. But yeah. everyone can hum. And humming changes your vibration. There's a great book called The Humming Effect. And it gives you all the ways that it really can just change your internal vibration. So I encourage everyone, to, whether it's Christmas songs or it's happy birthday or it's something that's good, you know, hum, hum a lot so it can help you shift your emotional energy and give you time to move from your emotion brain to your wise brain. So I think those are all the tips and I could go on for days, but I think those are, those are good ones we could start with today. Yeah, and those are excellent tips. I know the last one we just talked about, you know, you're kind of disconnecting consciously through mindfulness, disconnecting from the stimulus. I can tell you personally, um, without even thinking about it, I've done it in the past when I was in the military for sure. Uh, when I was a floor nurse, definitely, you know, as you're dealing with the constant stress, you know, whether it's somebody may be coding or you, you're dealing with somebody, you know, that's just an example, right? But um, it allows you to step aside and not get involved with what's going on and still be effective. So that's awesome. I like, I like that one. I talked to, I talked to someone today who was in a car accident and it, she was fine. Her children were fine. She's a psychologist and she talked about being able to see the accident coming and she is, and her body kicked into her brain and her body stepped back and she was able to say for her children, we're going to be okay. We're, we're about to hit this. We'll be fine. Keep breathing. She was able to talk them through. When you're able to step back, mm -hmm. you don't go into fight or flight. Your brain that knows what to do, any kind of medical or, or, or soldier, you know, or army service, right? All of those are about your body knowing what to do. Yeah. And if you don't let your body's or your brain's fight or flight kick in, you're able to use those skills that you have. And so she was able to talk her kids through it. And, and later she broke down and cried. But that idea that we know what to do if we trust, mm -hmm. we can get through things that are stressful. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you, April. These are awesome tips. And uh, anxiety is something that I think we all need to recognize and really deal with uh, for our well-being. Otherwise, if it's chronic, it could become a severe issue and, and maybe tap, tap into other underlying issues we may not want to uh, emphasize right so thank you for taking the time folks i hope you find this information useful stay tuned for our next video series uh it will be a different topic so we'll announce that here and uh hope you find this helpful you'll see april's information at the bottom of the video our information if we can be of assistance and thank you for joining us april thanks again thank you for having me all right stay safe you too bye-bye <laughs>